My name is Ija. I'm going to talk about continuous learning for Android malware detection. This is joint work with Jody and David. Uh, over the past 10 years or so, there are a lot of research papers that try to tackle the problem of Android malware detection. And we were wondering, is the problem already solved? If we take an Android malware data set containing both benign and malicious Android apps, do a random train test split, train a linear SVM classifier, the task performance is actually really good. We can get something like 99% accuracy and only 0.4% false positive rate. So this is great. Is there even anything left to do for Android malware detection? Unfortunately, the answer is the problem is not solved. Um, the great performance exists only because the test data distribution is roughly similar to training data distribution. Remember that in this experiment setup, we did a random train test split. Now, in the real-world deployment scenario, we have to train uh, a malware classifier on samples we've seen so far and deploy it on future test data. So this is another setup we did. We collected seven years' worth of data. Uh, we trained an Android malware classifier on data from 2012, and we tested it on future data over the six years period. Now, if we have a different test data distribution and test a classifier continuously over time, the test performance drops a lot. And here I'm highlighting two numbers here. On the left side, we have the F1 score of a classifier that was just trained, which was around 0.99 F1. And shortly after deploying a classifier for six months, the F1 score drops to only 0.77. So, Android malware classification hasn't been solved, and it seems like it still doesn't work that well. And this is typically um, called the concept problem in the community. There have been roughly three areas of research that tries to tackle the concept problem. Um, they are drift detection, drift adaptation, and learning robust features. In the research area of drift detection, notably, um, two lines of work are most related to this. One is transcendent, and the other is Kate. Transcendent builds on top of the conformal prediction theory to uh, find new samples that are most dissimilar to training samples, and they detect these as drifted. On the other hand, Kate uses representation learning technique specifically contrastive learning to learn a more, more robust embedding space. In the embedding space, then they can do some sort of clustering and use a distance-based measure to detect drifted samples. And there are a lot of other OOD detection schemes in the machine learning community. However, they have not been tested on security data set and we don't know how well they perform. Uh, in the second um, error, drift adaptation, Usually what we can do are two things. One is after we detect the drifted samples, we can reject them. So the classifier only predicts samples that we think have not drifted, and the performance of that classifier will be better. And the second is, if we detect drifted samples, we can ask a human analyst to label these samples, expand the training set, and reach in a classifier. So hopefully that is more robust against future samples. And lastly, um, to learn robust features. Um, one related work on, as an example is API Graph. API Graph learns semantically similar features um, that are more robust against drift. Specifically, if a malware sample evolves, um, they may appear differently in the original feature space, but the, the features API Graph learns will still stay stable over time, even for evolved malware. And given the same stable feature, we can then predict them correctly. So the classifier is more robust against drift. Um, so here is what this paper sits among related works. So in our paper, we try to focus on the drift adaptation technique that is active learning. And to do active learning better, uh, we're inspired by representation learning uh, literature, and we propose a new idea to do a more robust representation learning. Uh, specifically, we propose two ideas in this paper. One is uh, a new robust representation learning technique for contrastive learning, and second is a better way to do active learning. 
So in the slogan form, our vision for continuous learning for Android malware detection is cont uh, contrastive learning plus active learning. So in the remainder of the talk, due to time limitation, I'm gonna briefly talk about one new idea for contrastive learning and leave the, the other one for the audience to read in the paper. So why can contrastive learning help us to do better active learning? Here's what contrastive learning can do um, as an example. Um, so typically to do contrastive learning, we need labels of similar and dissimilar pairs of samples. And here I'm listing four malware families, where one of them, the last one is not trained, the UMP is not in the training set. If we label pairs of samples as similar, if they are in the same family, and pairs of samples are dissimilar in, if they're in different families, what contrastive learning can do is they can separate the data very well by family in the embedding space. So here on the left figure, the TSNI plot shows in the original feature space, there is no clear pattern of the families. But on the right figure, in the embedding space, different families form distinct clusters, and they are well separated. A nice thing this gives us if we have a nice embedding space is now we can do some distance measure in the embedding space to help us to do both active learning and be robust against drift. So in the same example, remember that we did not train on the malware family UMP. Even though the, contrastive, the standard contrastive learning didn't train on the family, the samples from new families still form very distinct clusters, and they're pretty far away from known families. So if we can design a nice distance measure, then we can pick out those samples and give them to human analysts, and then we can give correct labels to these, and now we can expand the training set and do active learning. On the other hand, on the right side, this example shows um, for known families, there are some gradually drifted samples. For example, malwares may gradually evolve. And here we have a data point, which is a variant of the existing malware family, Joy Kung Fu. It stayed pretty close to the original cluster of the samples. So if a classifier is trained on the embedding space, then it should naturally be more robust against such gradual drift. So this all seems really nice. And does it work on real world data sets? Unfortunately, we found out that just standard contrastive learning doesn't work on real world data sets. So we've collected seven years worth of Android apps. And if we do standard contrastive learning using one year worth of apps, the embedding space will look like something on this figure. Um, so here I'm plotting the TSNI figure for just three known families and the one new family. And the three known families include benign samples, ear push, and the faking star, um, malware, so two malware families. So we, originally we were expecting that if you have a new family, they should be really different from clusters of the existing families, so we can give human analyst label to these. However, when this new family occurs, the, the, the new at Mogul family, um, half of the samples were actually joining the benign sample space. We suspect that the reason may be largely due to the class imbalance problem. Uh, in a real world data set, the majority of samples are benign. And there's also uh, another challenge of long tail distribution of malware families that you may not get enough samples for each family to learn um, contrastive learning. So here's uh, the first new idea in our paper. In order to actually build a robust representation learning space, we propose hierarchical contrastive learning instead of the standard contrastive learning. On the high level, we want different malware families to be more similar than benign versus malware. Um, so here, it show, the two figures shows the difference in the embedding space between regular contrastive learning and hierarchical contrastive learning. On the left side, we have only two relations to learn. So either a pair of samples are similar or a pair of subsamples are dissimilar. Uh, and they are labeled by either malware family or the benign sample label. On the right side, now we have three relations to learn. Um, we still keep the original dissimilar relation, but for similarity, we have two levels of similarity. So we consider a strongly similar relation if two samples are from the same malware family. Uh, and the second is, if two samples are from different malware family, then we consider them to be weakly similar. 
Um, and also, if two samples are from both benign, labeled as benign, then we also consider them to be weakly similar. And for dissimilar, um, they're the same as before. We consider malware and benign to be dissimilar. So the nice thing of this is now we are also learning the relations between malware families. Um, so even if a new sample is a new family um, and we don't know anything about it, now the embedding space kind of can tell that the, the new sample is more similar to existing malware families than benign. So on the uh, right figure, what this shows is the new AdMogo family is now really close to known clusters of benign family. However, this still gives us some opportunity to select them for labels because some of these new samples are in between different clusters of known malware families. So um, before I talk about result, I'm gonna briefly describe how we can use this for active learning. This is a simplified view of active learning. Starting from the left side, clockwise, uh, we start from a training set. We train an initial classifier. The classifier can be used to predict new samples. And during test time, now we have to select some of the new samples for a human analyst to generate new labels. Expand the training set and retrain the classifier. Usually in a real world scenario, if we are given access to a human analyst, um, the, there's a constraint that a human analyst has limited bandwidth and therefore there's a fixed labeling budget we can give. The state of our um, technique to do active learning is uncertainty sampling. In our experience, uncertainty sampling is actually really hard to beat. So here, when we train a classifier, we're gonna train a new hierarchical contrastive classifier. So which was the first new idea I just talked about. And the second idea, new idea is we also propose a new uncertainty measure that can help us select better samples. And I'll leave that for um, interested people to read the paper. Here are some highlight result numbers. We really want to compare against uh, the best possible baseline, and therefore we use some of our new ideas to improve the previous schemes. And even though we can improve the previous scheme to the extent possible, Compared to the best input scheme, our method still re reduces the false negative rate by 1.3 times, and at the same time maintain under 1% false positive rate. On the other hand, we want to see how much this can save us analyst bandwidth. If we care about maintaining a steady F1 score over time, we can decrease the labeling cost by eight times. One example of why we can do so well is um, here, the figure just shows that when there's a drop of the F1 score for both the baseline scheme and, and our scheme, there's a new ransomware family occurring, and our method is able to quickly pick up these new family samples and label these to quickly recover from the drift. All right, I'm gonna quickly conclude. Um, we want to argue that concept drift is a major problem in security. In this paper, we showed opportunities to do better, and we want to encourage the community to study for multiple security tasks. For example, there can be PE malware detection, log analysis, network traffic analysis problems. And we think there are opportunities to develop new techniques for other kinds of drifts. Uh, we haven't thought, um, like, study the gradual drift and the rec recurring themes of drift due to users' behavior, and these are new opportunities that we can study. And thank you for listening, and our code is available online, this link, and I'll take questions.